This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 7th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, Vincent. Uh, I'll just be quick here since we have... This is a quickie. Uh, 80 degrees. Crazy. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. partly sunny. 14C in New York and cloudy. It's been raining the last two days. Uh, our guest today from the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, Paul Offit. Welcome back. Thank you. It's, um, thank you for having me back. Yeah, we, you've been on quite a bit, and um, there's good reason because you uh, have a great take on the COVID vaccine situation, and that's why we hear, have you here today. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, or two weeks, you, you sent me an email, and the first line reads, the bivalent booster dosing story should be a cautionary tale of how not to move forward in this pandemic. And then you set forth your reasons for saying that, and I thought this would be an important issue for people to hear as we're moving into holidays and people are wondering if they should get vaccinated or whatever. So what's the story here, Paul? So when Omicron came into the United States, end of December 2021, beginning of January 2022, um, this was an immune evasive strain. So it had had a number of changes in the receptor binding domain, at least 15. And so it escaped largely neutralizing antibodies that had been induced by the vaccine or a previous infection. And that worried people. Um, it worried them that um, that this could then render monoclonal antibodies ineffective. It worried them that this could make render the vaccine ineffective. And so there was an interest by the companies and by the government in moving forward with a vaccine that contained that strain, the BA1 strain. And so... Um, the both Pfizer and Moderna then made a uh, bivalent vaccine that included the original strain on uh, the ancestral strain and this BA1 strain. For Moderna, it was 25 micrograms and 25 micrograms. For Pfizer, it was 15 and 15. They then did studies the right way involving a few hundred people in each group to answer the question, if you got a monovalent boost as compared to a bivalent boost, did you have a, a greater neutralizing antibody response against BA1 with the bivalent vaccine? And those data were- Excuse, excuse me, uh, you said monovalent versus bivalent. Monovalent being the ancestral strain? Yes, sorry. Yeah, the, okay. the ancestral strain only, as compared to the ancestral strain plus BA one. Okay. So, so the um, the companies then presented their data to the vaccine advisory committee, the FDA's vaccine advisory committee, on June twenty eighth of this year, and the data were underwhelming. They did the studies the right way. Um, they looked at the, the the same interval for getting a monovalent boost. Or a, mono, or a bivalent boost. And, and there was, depending on which company you were talking about, a 1.5 to 1.75 fold increase in neutralizing antibodies against BA1, which was unlikely to be a clinically significant difference. Uh, we saw, for example, back in December 2020, when Pfizer and Moderna presented their data, Moderna had roughly a two-fold increase in neutralizing antibodies um, against the ancestral strain as compared to Pfizer, but that didn't work out to be any difference in terms of protection against serious disease, which is the goal of this vaccine. So, so that nonetheless, the um, the fear was that these viruses were continuing to evolve and that these variants would become even more resistant. And so the decision was made by the companies and the government, the FDA, to move forward then with a bivalent vaccine. But at this time, and this is already a cautionary tale, by this time in, in June, BA1 was gone. So all this work that had been done on the BA1 bivalent was to be thrown out. And so so because BA4, BA5 now in June of, of this year was uh, predominant, they moved forward with a bivalent vaccine containing BA4, BA5. And um, the, then, then what happened was um, the day after we met, the, um, the government issued a press release saying that they were going to buy 105 million doses of Pfizer's BA4, BA5 bivalent vaccine. Um, a month after that, on July 29th of this year, um, the government stated, uh, HHS, DOD stated that they would buy another 66 million doses of Moderna's vaccine. So therefore, the government purchased 171 million doses of these bivalent vaccines pretty much without any human data at that point. 
So then what happened is, again, without human data, on September 1st, the CDC, um, at the same time that the um, FDA withdrew its EUA for a monovalent vaccine, then recommended a bivalent vaccine with BA4, BA5, again, without any human data, uh, for everyone over 12 years of age. A month and a half later, on October 12th, they extended that recommendation to include everybody over five years of age to receive a booster dose, period. No no, uh, no uh, attempt to try and just focus on the high-risk groups, which would be the elderly, people who are immune compromised, people who have high-risk medical conditions. Everybody over five should get this vaccine. The hum- first human data to appear occurred out of David Ho's lab at Columbia, where uh, he had a preprint on August 22nd that was available, which has now been accepted to, for publication at the New England Journal of Medicine, doing the studies the right way, where he looked at, at uh, a couple dozen people who had either gotten a monovalent boost or a bivalent boost with BA4, BA5, no difference in neutralizing antibodies. It wasn't even a 1.5 to 1.75 fold difference. It was no difference in neutralizing antibodies. Um, and then two days later, Dan Baruch and his laboratory at, at Harvard uh, did the same study, um, looking at whether or not this bivalent vaccine containing BA4, BA5 uh, increased neutralizing antibodies, not at all. And he also looked at T cells, specifically CD8 or CD4 positive T cells, to see if that was enhanced. Not at all. Um, And so basically, you're still waiting for some human data to suggest that this is a value. Um, What then happened was the CDC, and and, uh, Dr. Griffin actually reviewed this study, had a publication in uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report looking at what happens if you get a bivalent vaccine and period. They didn't compare it to a monovalent vaccine because the monovalent vaccine booster dose EUA had been withdrawn. So you were just looking at people either got a bivalent vaccine with BA4, BA5, or didn't. Now, this was when BA4, BA5 was still predominant. And what they found was that- Uh, Excuse me, this is in people who have otherwise not previously been vaccinated? No, these are people who have received two, three, or four doses of the monovalent vaccine. Okay, okay. so it's not a, what you're saying is it's not a head-to-head comparison of monovalent and bivalent in this boost, but just the bivalent. Okay, fine, That's right. you could go only, for it. You could only compare it to historical boost with monovalent. Fine. You could do it at the same time. And what they found was that there was essentially a modest uh, increase in protection against mostly mild disease within a month of having received this boost for what was would likely be short-lived protection against mild disease. And that was it, which is not a reasonable public health strategy to just sort of increase protection against mild disease in the short term. But there was uh, no severe disease in this study, if I remember right. Just just mild disease. So 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 that's where we are. So now you have the government, which has purchased 171 million doses of the vaccine, about a little less than 40 million. So about a little more than 10 percent of people in this country for whom this vaccine has been recommended have gotten it. But now where are you? I mean, now you're in December. BA4 is gone. BA5 is less than 25 percent of circulating strains, only to be replaced by, you know, uh, BQ1, BQ11, uh, uh, XBB, XBB1. So uh, again, which are somewhat more resistant then to those neutralizing antibodies you would have gotten had you actually had an increased antibody response to BA4, BA5. So I'd like to think the lesson here is don't do this. Don't chase variants, especially since the current vaccines are still protective against serious disease. That's the good news about these vaccines. They still do protect against serious disease. Uh, A variant hasn't yet arisen that is resistant to protection by either immunization or or natural infection to serious disease. So you're not pressed at this point. At this point, am I correct that the, uh, well, what's available for vaccines? I'm in, in particular, I'm curious about people who've never been vaccinated. Okay. And there's going to be, you know, some who didn't get vaccinated previously for whatever reason, and there's going to be some new individuals in the population. What's available for them? And yeah, so the primary series, you can still get, obviously, the monovalent vaccine. In fact, that's what you get. You get the okay. monovalent vaccine as your primary series. And then if you're going to get a booster dose, um, you could then you only have the option of getting mm-hmm. this current bivalent vaccine. But to, okay. be fully, to be fully immunized in the U.S., you don't need that bivalent, do you? Right. Well, the, the term uh, to be fully immunized is, is almost a legal term more than anything else. So, the, so, <laughs> so two doses, technically, you're considered to be fully protected at two doses. And right. then if you get a third dose or fourth dose or 10th dose, you're considered to be up to date. So uh, uh, pardon me, I want to I clarify this. Um, so if I've never been vaccinated before, I would get two doses of the monovalent? That, that's right. 
And okay. Then, and right. then if I wanted a third dose, that would be the bi bivalent because that's classified as a booster, correct? Right. All right. There's no indication, well, I guess there's no data really, that I'm any worse off with that situation, right? What are, what are the data? Right. So I think that's right. I, I think, I think the bi, as far as we know, the, the bivalent vaccine, I think, is no uh, less safe than was the monovalent as a boost. Um, I don't think it's going to be any worse than the monovalent as a boost. I guess my feeling about this is we didn't really need to do this. I, you know, and okay. what worries me is that sometimes uh, those who are representing public health will, will make claims about the bivalent vaccine that just aren't true. You know, claims mm. that it's going to be better at, at, uh, at, at providing broader protection. It's going to be better at preventing transmission. And, and those sorts of things just can't say that because it's it's this the, the goal of the vaccine is preventing serious illness. If we really start to, to tell the public that they, they, they're, they're better off with this vaccine because they're going to be prevented at even having mild illness, people are going to be really disappointed because it's, if it prevents mild illness, it won't be for long. And people will say, wait, they told me this was going to prevent me from mild illness. And now I've gotten the vaccine and a few months later I have a mild illness, you know, they, they weren't honest with me. And so you, you run the risk of losing the public's trust. Now, at this point in the pandemic, we can't do the sorts of uh, uh, studies that we did initially, right? Where you're, where you have a whole bunch of people that are naive to all of this and you can uh, compare plus and minus vaccine or, or different vaccines. There's got to be, but there must be some sort of follow-up uh, uh, that's mandated of the company's uh, manufacturing these to get some idea of the effectiveness uh, and certainly continued safety of, of these uh, bivalent vaccines. Is that correct? Sure. Although I think really um, where this really falls is the CDC. I think okay. what you want to know at this point is who's getting hospitalized and who's dying? Who who are those people? Um, how old are they? Do they have comorbidities? Are they taking drugs that are immune suppressive? Have they gotten vaccines? If so, which vaccine? When did they get their vaccines? That's what you need to know. So, so and, and especially for children who have been vaccinated now can be vaccinated down to six months of age. Um, are there differences? Because when you when you make a recommendation for children, for example, the 12 to 15 year old or the 5 to 11 year old or now the less than five year old, you, you, you have a difference in dosing, say, between the 11 year old child and the 12 year old child, even though there's not a tremendous biological difference between those two children, as well as the sort of four year old mm -hmm. versus five-year-old or six-year-old. So do they need boosters? For how long is that, or, the, or is immunity, again, against severe disease going to last? It's a little harder in children because it's just general rule children don't get severe disease. I mean, they are said another way, they have, they are 1,000-fold less likely to suffer a severe disease than, say, someone who's over 65. But I think that's what you need to know. And so, so for me, for example, I had three doses of the vaccine. My third dose was in November 2021. I got a mild infection in May, so probably with BA2, one of the Omicron on subvariants. Am I, I don't plan to get a booster dose. And, and what I'd like to know is, do I ever need a booster dose? Or am I protected against severe disease for two years, five years, 10 years? They need to provide those data. And because right now we don't know. So what ends up happening is the fallback position is, all right, we don't know, let's just boost everybody. And, and, and worse, I think we're heading into a time where people may go, well, let's just make this a yearly vaccine. When this is an influenza, I, I'm not sure, I don't think we, at, at least as it stands, need a yearly vaccine, or at least not everybody needs a yearly vaccine. So if we're going to do that. Define who needs it. Prove who needs it. Do you, do you think, so, so your letter was all about, let's realize that this strategy isn't reasonable. Do you think that CDC, uh, FDA are going to realize this or they're going to just make a new booster every year whenever it is that they feel like it, right? You would think in a better world, I'm not sure we live in that world, but you would think in a better world that we really learned a lesson here. Uh, for, for at the very least, think of all the money that was spent making a BA1 vaccine and by the time you were considering it, BA1 was gone. All the money that was spent making a BA4, BA5 vaccine, and now that represents probably less than 25% of what's circulating. And the rest of what's circulating is not going to be as susceptible to that vaccine. Can, can we just say that we've learned this lesson and stopped doing this and just pay attention to a variant or variants that arise that are, are really resistant to protection against severe disease and focus our effort on that because this chasing variants is a losing game. And I think you shouldn't play games you can't win. Well, uh, you're on 
uh, you have been at least on the panels that uh, at least advise in these decisions and know some of the other players. Uh, is it your impression that your message is uh, sinking in or being taken seriously? Um, I don't know. I, I, don't I was know. On, on the January, oh, sorry, on the June twenty eighth uh, committee that considered the FDA vaccine advisory committee. Uh, there were twenty one people who voted. Nineteen voted yes. Two voted no. I was one of the no votes and tried to make a case then that that look at these neutralizing antibody titers. They're not much different from what right. we saw in December twenty twenty. I don't think there's going to be any difference here. But the thinking was that that. Um, there was just something we wanted to do. And so we opened the door and we'll see how it plays out. In a better world, I think we look at these data and realize at some level we were burned by this. I don't think we're any worse off with the bivalent vaccine. I just think that it was an unnecessary thing to do. Right. Okay. So one of the things that really interests me about all of this is that uh, three immunizations, that is the primary series and a boost with the ancestral strain, seems to be effective uh, and as effective as the bivalent boost against new variants when you're talking about just the ancestral strain. So uh, in, in order to understand what should be done, it seems to me that it would be helpful to understand what's actually going on in that situation. Why is it that a, that a boost with the ancestral strain helps me with the variants that come up? And so far, at least, seemingly regardless of variant, what's happening? No, it's great. And I think that's a great point. So what you would love to see, and, and we always talk about this at our FDA vaccine advisory committee, that because we always focus on neutralizing antibodies, which are generally short-lived, and, and maybe that's not what we should be spending most of our time on. What we should be spending most of our time on is, let's look at, at cytotoxic T cell responses, T helper cell responses, which have been shown both in animal models and I think in people to be important in protection against severe disease. The other thing that I think gets lost in this is because all we talk about is vaccines and boosting. There are no doubt people in those three high-risk groups that I just mentioned who don't make a very good immune response. Mm -hmm. And no matter how many doses you're going to give them, they're not going to make a very good immune response. So make sure that those people, especially people over 75, take Paxlovid in the first few days of their illness. Uh, Dr. Griffin on his clinical updates has made this point several times. And, and that's absolutely true because I think it is underutilized at some level. And what's interesting is why there was an article in the Atlantic um, called Inside the Mind of the Anti-Paxer, which I think uh, Dr. Griffin also <laughs> reviewed. But the point that he made was that uh, it's not not the sort of left-right divide that you see with uh, vaccines. It's lo largely things like fear of, of Paxlovid rebound, which is mm. not a thing. So it would, I think it's important upon us to educate people about that because I think Paxlovid is, is really a, a, a lifesaver for some who aren't making good immune responses. So we get a lot of emails from people who say, should I get the booster, the bivalent booster? People are really confused. So what do we tell them? I think it's probably reasonable, although it would be nice for the CDC to prove this. <laughs> okay. We did prove it at some level. When Omicron came in, they looked at people who had gotten a third dose or not gotten a third dose and found that there was a lesser risk of hospitalization in the group that had received mm -hmm. Dose, but that, but the, those who benefited were, were in those three high risk groups. The UK did the same study recently published in Lancet, finding the same thing. Is that also true for the next year? Uh, or is it that those people who are getting hospitalized and dying from this virus who are in those high risk groups doing that because they never made a good immune response, in which case Paxlovid really should be the emphasis. So I, but I think that people who are in those three groups reasonably could get another dose until we learn more. But for everybody else, I don't think so. I mean, when parents ask me and they parents of a 10 year old, 12 year old, you know, do you recommend that my child get a boost? My answer is no. But if they it, I don't recommend it. But if they want it, um, because that is the recommendation, I obviously we would give it. I just don't see the need to encourage it. Uh, so I get confused and I'm sure I'm not alone uh, in uh, counting doses here. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, because <clears throat> so th the initial series is two doses, right? A month apart. Uh, right. And yeah. then, so uh, we're calling, so if we talk about three doses, we're talking about the initial two doses and then a third dose that's a boost. Uh, let me ask it this way. Uh, what would your recommendation be for sort of the minimum for everybody, regardless of risk group? So there was a paper in, 
science immunology with Chen as the first author um, out of a group at Harvard to try and answer the question up to this point, um, what gives you sort of the best, broadest immunity, which is likely to be long lasting? And um, what he concluded well, and his colleagues concluded was that either three doses of the vaccine with that third dose being given four to six months later or two doses of the vaccine plus a natural infection. So I, I think it's I think in the end, it's, it can reasonably be considered a three dose vaccine, although we don't you know, because of the way that it, the, it's being described, you know, two doses is fully vaccinated, three doses up to date. I think it's a three dose vaccine. Right. Okay. That, and, and yeah, that makes sense to me. And and that to me, that interval between the second dose and the third dose, that is the boost is really sort of a immune maturation phase that the, uh, that the boost that uh, can then work on. And that, that strikes me that that's, what's critical in giving you the coverage over the, uh, the variants. Is that, is that a, a fair statement? I completely agree. And unfortunately, the way that it's worded, the CDC recommendation is the CDC says at least two months. And and there were push there was pushback at the advisory committee for immunization practice meeting, which is the committee that advises the CDC, because they didn't like the two month recommendation. They wanted it to be longer, you know, four months longer. And and the way that they were mollified essentially was to say, well, we're saying at least two months, because I think they wanted to give as much vaccine as they could mm. without having to wait four to six months since they have, you know, 170 million doses ready to to to, to roll. Um, but I think you're, I think you're right. I, I think uh, that that it's important to have a longer interval there. And so then I know that this is a uh, redundant of what you've probably already said. But on top of that three dose series, uh, uh, do I perceive correctly that do you think it's uh, reasonable or recommended for people in certain high risk groups to get the fourth dose? And right now, the only thing that's available is the bivalent thing, but there's no there's no apparent downside to that. I do, but but again, I because I, I do think that makes sense. But I would like to see the CDC help us out here. Yeah, who is getting hospitalized, and also to to, to do a better job at, at separating out who's getting uh, hospitalized or dying with COVID as compared to from COVID. Because that, that I can tell you, in our hospital, uh, anybody who comes into the hospital is tested to see whether they have, uh, you know, their SARS-CoV-2 mm-hmm. positive. And, and that gets reported as a, an admission. Um, so, you know, it, it is confusing. I think California, there was a study done looking at just trying to separate out, you know, who really was getting hospitalized for COVID by just doing a simple screening, who's getting steroids, who's getting supplemental oxygen. And you found that the numbers for hospitalizations was lower than what was reported. So this is where the CDC can help us. It's hard when you don't have a national health system. That's why we end up looking to places like Canada, the UK, Israel, where those data can be more easily collected. So if the bivalent boost uh, doesn't give uh, a really robust uh, increase in neutralizing antibody to the variant, uh, does that suggest something about potentially original antigenic sin with this virus? Well, first of all, I should say, just to be clear, when I said that it, it was, it's no better than a monovalent boost. So, so you do get a boost with the monovalent right. and you get a boost with the bivalent. It's just not any better with right. the monovalent. But it, both David Ho and, um, and Dan Brook in their, in their uh, papers that are going to be coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine both said the same thing. They think that the hill that's been too hard to climb is, is imprinting, you know, originally. Okay. Because what you're doing is you're giving, especially when you give both in the same vial, you're, you're, you're going to a germinal center that's already primed mm. for those epitopes from Wuhan 1, which are shared, you know, with uh, BA4, BA5 or whatever is there. And so there's going to be a preferential response to that. So it's harder to get a response then to these novel epitopes on, you know, on these variant strains. We have not done any studies of people who just get BA whatever, right, in, in a vaccine because that doesn't exist, correct? Well, when, when when Pfizer presented to to our committee on June 28th, they did have a, an arm where so, so they had these arms. They had you get a bivalent vaccine with 15 micrograms of Wuhan one of the ancestral strain, and then 15 micrograms of, of in that case BA one, or they gave uh, 30 micrograms of BA one alone, mm-hmm. or they gave 60 micrograms of BA one alone. And and with those last two, um, you did get a somewhat higher neutralizing antibody response. It wasn't dramatic. I mean, you now instead of being 1.5 fold. It was twofold greater, threefold greater, but it suggested that, that that you may be able to overcome this 
with a higher dose or and with giving it uh, alone without giving it at the same time that you're giving the Wuhan one strain. So I'm not sure that tells me it may not be antigenic sin, right? Because it's just similar enough that you're getting a similar response, right? So by separating out the uh, Omicron, you, you still get a similar, as you said, slightly higher, but it, it's, it should have been much higher if it's really all antigenic sin. So I'm not sure that's the right. answer, right? You're absolutely right. And, and I mean, if look, it, it, Lynn Safe did a study, uh, again, in New England Journal of Medicine, mm-hmm. finding looking at healthcare workers who got two doses or three doses. And with that third dose of just, the, again, the ancestral strain, you clearly got an increased antibody response to, you know, BA4, BA5, BA1. So right. you're right. right. Off, uh, by the way, do you know what has been the uptake of uh, bivalent vaccines in the U.S.? Like what fraction of people have received them? So uh, the the in that MMWR study by the CDC, they had stated that there were 35 million doses that were had been administered of the 171, um, and now it's a little closer to 40 million. But you know, you're making a recommendation for more than 300 million people, so it's maybe mm. a little more than 10 percent of the population for whom this is recommended has gotten. I also think it it's a problem for vaccine acceptance, right? There's a lot of confusion, and people are like, "Why should there be confusion over this? Is that a, an issue? You think?" Definitely. I, I think also that there's definitely booster fatigue. Uh, that's part of it. And mm-hmm. I think people, for the most part, um, believe that we're largely past this. And I think to some extent that's true. Uh, you know, we, we have probably 95 percent or so population immunity. There's studies that have been done saying a, a, a much larger percentage of the population has been naturally infected than you would have guessed. Um, you know, you have at least 70 plus percent people who've been vaccinated. Um, so, and I, if you look at the, the the incidence of hospitalizations and deaths now, and compare it to December a year ago or two years ago, it's much much better. And so we'll see. Well, I think we're going to learn a lot this winter to see how what kind of a surge we get. I know that that the um, Dr. Ja, you know, who's one of the part of the White House COVID coordination team, has predicted a big surge, but we'll we'll see. Uh, that that may not be true. So um, this is probably an unanswerable question. Well, of course it's an unanswerable question, but I. Um, I wonder whether this variation is going to continue indefinitely, okay, or whether the virus is going to find, you know, have tried everything and establish some sort of uh, equilibrium with, well, this is the best I can do, okay, and sort of stabilize <laughs> at a at a particular variant. Because it seems to me, from what I know, that as far as human coronaviruses go, this is a lot more uh, variation than. Uh, we were aware of in in the other uh, viruses. I agree. Although it would be interesting to look at the four strains of circulating human coronavirus as closely as we're looking at this virus um, to see whether that is true. Because I'm wondering, among other things, uh, if there will be a time down in the future where the primary series is better done with something other than the ancestral strain. Okay, but if the variation is going to continue at this pace, you do run into a a trap there of trying to keep pace with this thing when you know that the ancestral strain will do a good job. I agree. Uh, So so, so we'll see. I think you have to look at disease, severe disease, right? If it stays low with ancestral, why change it? I agree. (laughs) I say that. All right, so let's end with what we what are we doing for most people? The primary series in a boost should be sufficient, right? I think that's right. Healthy, healthy young people, and I'm defining young as less than 75, in part because I'm 71. But I think... No, oh, thank you. Me too. I'm young. And <laughs> primary series in a boost is three shots. First two a month apart, second several months after the first two. Right, and we probably should, if you got to go back in time and do this again, I think we probably should have defined this as a three-dose series. I think there are yeah. some people out there who have gone, mm. I'm fully vaccinated. I've gotten two doses. And yeah. it, it, no, no, that's definitely not true, it seems. Yeah. yeah, okay. And then for people over 75, immunocompromised people, uh, severe health problems, for then, maybe it's a good idea to get the, the bivalent booster, right? Yes, I, I think so. And, and you know, we um, it would be nice to, to define that further. In other yeah, words, sure. health problems. And, and, and to what degree are you immune compromised? Because those are broad terms. Okay. Rich, anything else? I'm Got good. it. We're good. All right. Special TWIV show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have any questions, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute to our guest today from... University of Pennsylvania and Chop Pull off it. Thanks again for coming back. 
Thank you. And in the spring, when we have all these data, we'll get you back again to talk about it. Yeah, good. Sounds good. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to American Society for Virology, American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral.